Hello and welcome to Concentric Circles, the show about being a 21st century creative. My name is Jim Tramontana. Today I am joined with the illustrious Vinny Fiorello, John O'Diener, and Obi Fernandez. How are you, fellas? Chilling. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say, I like, you know, I like this look that you're sporting. Who? Uh, Jim. Fun. Oh, what, the black and not... Yeah, so, but, but like you got like, you got the, you look like you're slightly... Uh, you got a little bit of melanin in your skin. Yeah. You know what I mean? The five o'clock shadow. You got like, uh, you know, good hair. You're having a good hair day. Good hair day. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I like this. You look, you look like, younger. You look like Jason Newstead without the long ass hair. No, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to pick up a bass guitar and, and have my mix totally edited out of the, the final uh, product, product. So, yeah. Yeah, Bob, Bob, Bob Rock's going to come in and do the final bass for you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. That guy, that guy. He'll hit you in the face of the chair and then be like, all right, cool. That's, the, that's like, that's like the, the long blonde haired dude that like came in and had like a lot of gum attitude. He was like, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that dude. Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, Bob Rock, you know, famous producer who's produced, you know. Whatever. Of- what do you mean, brother? Oh. I feel like a long time ago, I made a conscious decision in my heart and in my head to say, screw that guy. <laughs> yeah, you're, coming in, you're coming in on fire right now, man. You're saying Jim's hot and screw Bob Rock? Come on, man. I'm, I'm just trying, you know, I'm trying to compliment Jim. Thank you. you. Priority straight. You know, I'm trying to like lift a brother up. Thank you. Yeah, these guys are trying to keep me down, and Obi's the only one that's in my corner lifting me up. So I it's called it. drama, okay? Let <laughs> <laughs> it happen, baby. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but speaking of like rock and roll, man, we lost one of the greats this uh, week, uh, Eddie Van Halen. Rest in peace. One of the, yeah. the greatest metal guitarists, I think, of all time, personally. And probably influenced a lot of like popular hard rock for shit decades. I mean, guitar period, you know? I mean, when you got like someone like Ingve Malmsteen saying that Eddie was a big influence on him, you know that's a that's a big deal. For for those who don't know, Obi Ingve Malmsteen is a classically trained metal guitarist. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, I know, in, his con- I know and in his contract, you're not allowed to look him in the eyes, or else you get fired. Yeah, that's right. He's also that's no- awesome. Jerk. He's a good dude. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to like diss on because he's supposedly a giant jerk. But I mean, dude, the Eddie Van Halen story is like is kind of like. That dude's been through a lot, man. Yeah. Like, it was pretty heartbreaking. And just, like, to have that much notoriety, but then at the same time deal with the amount of crap that he's had to deal with, mm-hmm. and then sickness, and then, you know, uh, addiction. And I'm just, it's just, like, it was wild. It was wild. Yeah, he's lived, like, a hundred lives, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, for real on that. Uh, you should check out uh, the story, Google... Uh, when Eddie Van Halen tried out for Limp Bizkit. That's a Shut up. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's a real thing. So I'm not going to, no spoiler, but look it up. It's a, it's a great, great, great story. Ending, I'll tell you the end, right? The ending is uh, Eddie Van Halen pulling up in front of uh, the dude from the singer from Limp Bizkit, his house in a tactical armored vehicle with no shirt smoking a cigarette. Now, <laughs> on the story and read through it. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, uh, it's a great, it's a great story. I just gave you like a little morsel to, yeah, to get there with. Uh, yeah. Side note: the Wait. only guitar, the only song I know, guitar, uh, <laughs> from the beginning to the end is "Eruption." Nice. You can play. That's it. I can play "Eruption." That's the only song I know from beginning, first note to last note. It's the only song that I know how to play on guitar in, in a complete form. That's it. I'm I also impressed. love that of all the songs, it's the guitar solo song. <laughs> that, that's it. That's I'm it. I, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I never, like, sat down to do, like, Kumbaya or whatever, right? Like, never <laughs> like that. No, no, I no. sat down to learn guitar, and it was Eruption. And I worked on it until I knew what it is, and that's the only thing. Just like... I don't, the only song I know on piano is the beginning of Mr. Crowley by uh, Ozzy Osbourne. That's it. Wow. Okay. Dude, look at all this you're like pulling out here. 
And that, that Vinny is a secret metalhead. We always knew. What do you mean a secret metalhead? No, he's not. It's not a secret. He's always been a metalhead. All my best friends are metalheads. I'm glad you said it so I didn't have to bring that up. <laughs> it's my best for the lesson. I'm, I'm not ashamed. It's, it's still ass cap, still fucking says what's up. <laughs> that's great uh, so, how do we frame what you just said <laughs> wow, man. I, I'm, I'm, feel, I'm feeling you know I'm feeling it right now man like I've been extremely like busy I've been doing a lot of creative work which is good I side note uh, you know that I did 619 I did a short story back in June 2019 uh, October I'm doing a, a poem a day for 31 days Very and uh i've been feeling you know it's been fun and weird and, and cool and working on music with ob for the inevitables working on production stuff for the kickstarter like getting ready to silk screen a bunch of record covers and t-shirts and just a lot of weird cool things that i'm excited about man anytime that i could make more toys and do things with my brain and my hands and, and everything it's been a good few weeks since we last spoke. Two weeks, in fact. That's a good vibe. The that sounds like year is 100. Vibe. So, with that said, man, we should uh, we should jump in, right? And get ready to party. Let's, let's party. Party. Well, it's funny you mention that because we have a fantastic guest on the show today. Uh, today, please welcome Mr. Mark Giuliano, who is the guitarist of the pop punk band Goalkeeper and also an outpatient counselor in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Mark has six plus years of counseling ex counseling experience and has worked with a variety of mood disorders, psychotic disorders, and addictions. Mm -hmm. Mark spent his time working at Villanova University, working with students suffering from addiction, and from there moved on to community mental health, and now works with, uh, with those suffering from many uh, afflictions, including opiate addictions. Mark is currently working in a com community me mental health program that specializes in mood disorders, as well as mental health diagnoses such as bipolar, schizophrenia, personality disorders and IDE IDD excuse me Mark I murdered your bio but you are a beautiful human being please welcome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, oh, thanks guys <laughs> I, I, I think you know we were doing a little talk with Jim prior about the bio and <laughs> I, I think we we, uh, we we cursed we cursed mr. Kamatana uh, and he <laughs> totally butchered the bio but uh, we get it man like Mark Giuliano is uh, a pop punker, but he also uh, spends his daytime and maybe nighttime hours like talking about and talking with people who need to talk it out, right? I mean, it's yeah. the long and the short of it, right? And uh, we're doing this, uh, and the topic tonight is uh, creatives and uh, mental health, which is a huge thing. You know, every person that I knew that was a painter or a writer, band, always tangled with some of, of mental health issue. And uh, I, I don't know necessarily know why it's funny. It, the little funny aside to it is that I always thought that if you open yourself up creatively, uh, th there's moments that you're opening yourself up for everything. So you get this flood of emotion that comes in. So at least that's my thought on why creatives, it, it sort of creeps in on average a little bit more than than everybody else. But we could talk with Mark tonight uh, about mental health and all the stuff that he's gone through. Uh, story for me though, real quick, it, I struggled two and a half years ago, massive mental health, massive depression. And uh, it started with a injury and then left on tour with that injury. And the mental health, my mental health w declined uh, almost on a, you could like, ticket on a daily basis. It just declined all the way down. Uh, I zigzagged across the United States and zigzagged across the world with massive depression, right? So like for me, I, I, I want to talk with, with somebody like Mark and just go, you know, how, how on just a, a level, just a, a top level of how to kind of pull yourself up out of it and not necessarily try to untangle it, but just float on the surface because I feel sometimes, especially we're in pandemic, we're in uh, 
the most crazy uh, election season possible right now, right? And people are feeling it, man. Look, my friends around me are feeling it. I, though there's a weight that's around right now. So I think talking about mental health and talking about just little tips on on how to, you know, not get get swallowed by the tide. I think tonight is going to be a good one, man. I'm stoked to talk with Mark. Thank you for for coming on and, and talking with all of us. So uh, let's do this, man. I mean, I, I don't know what's said. Let's do this. No, that's awesome. Stoked, man. Stoked. I think I think there's always something really special, right? Like there's always like the um, the story that points to getting involved and in wanting to be the person that actually gets to walk other people through some of these like really tough things. What, what was what was it for you? Because I'm going to assume and please correct me if I'm wrong. You know, you're, you you play in a pop punk band. You probably grew up playing in bands your whole entire life, like discovering yeah. this music, <laughs> discovering, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of uh, alternate lifestyle, right? Uh, that's probably not the phrase I should use because people are going to take that <laughs> the wrong way. But just just the alternative, like you know, like we all didn't fit in in school, right? You know what I mean? Like you couldn't. You probably found yourself in multiple places, kind of deal. So, yeah, what was the story that kind of brought you? into this whole, this whole place. Yeah. So my, so growing up, um, I was hit by a car when I was five. Mm. And so my family definitely suffered from like PTSD. Mm. And so growing up, I wasn't always allowed to like hang out with like everybody. Like I had some friends and like, there were a couple like of the, like the no show birthday parties, like as a kid and everything. Um, and so I was the kid who would literally jump from activity to activity, just trying to find like my place. Like in six, like I always played football and lacrosse and lacrosse was like my main sport in high school, but I never hung out with, with the team because after, after that I'd be hanging out with my friends that I made who were super into like video games and call of duty. And we used to do this activity on the weekends cause we didn't drink where this is, it's called night mission. If it sounds lame, fuck off um <laughs> but it was back when we used to have like map quests and things so we would like print out the map of the area and we would like pick where we wanted to make it to but we'd have to sneak out before like you know uh, after curfew and have to make it there only using like backyards right That's like awesome we, yeah and like we know vandalism nothing none of that we, we might like mess with people and like put their picnic table on the other side of their yard just to kind of, you know just to be funny but um like never broke anything, but it was just like fun. And like, I've definitely had people come out with guns and dogs have like ran after us and stuff because they don't know. I mean, the, I one, time, the one time we did it, we didn't realize there was a, like a string of house break-ins and like we're running around people's backyards. So, um, but like I had those friends and I had the football friends and then I had the music friends. So um, as I kind of like got through high school, I actually quit sports because what I started to like hate was the fact that um, I would do everything right. Like I wouldn't party, I would practice all the time. And then I would still be punished because like my teammates would like go out drinking and get busted by the cops. And I'd have to run 500 suicides for like their issue. And so that kind of like brought me down like a lot mm -hmm. because I felt like I had all this control, I'm doing all the right things, but yeah, I'm still being punished. So I felt like very lost in that. And I ultimately ended up quitting lacrosse which I was like going to have college scholarships. I had like schools like Villanova and stuff like coming out to look at me. So I had to like tell my parents, like, I'm not going to go for like an athletic scholarship, um, which was hard for them. I feel like to hear a little bit, like they're super supportive, like the most supportive parents. Um, but when it's like, Hey, I'm going to choose to pay for school, <laughs> which then added to that stressor as well, because it's like, well, I'm trying to do what I want to do. And yet I feel like I'm making the wrong decision. So it's like, I had to keep like for just something in my head. I just had to keep fighting knowing it was like the right decision. And uh, I guess through like that whole process, when I was in college, like picking a major, I did like the math major for a year. I did business and I realized that like I had a friend who went to Drexel who uh, was showing me some of the psychology stuff. And I was like, Oh my God, like this is like what I went through. Mm. And all of, like the techniques that I like used on myself without realizing and mm -hmm. it helped and I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And 
changed my major that next day to psychology and finished school and got the master's degree and um, always stayed with music because although I don't really create the songs in the band as much as like my bandmates Ryan and Cody because they are they're the creatives like they know how to like put their thoughts and feelings into words and to music and I'm much more of like how do I get the action steps like okay you guys did this how do we take this here and like Vinny you know working together like he can see that um but what I liked about being a band was like unlike a sport it was like you could do it by yourself right like if you did something and you worked really really hard you'd see the payoff and you get to choose who you surround yourself with which is a lot of what i preach in my therapy is a lot of your own accountability and your decisions like you're choosing to stay with this toxic individual or individuals so and in a with like sports you can never do that in high school you're limited to who you you know well this is my high school so this is the only team i can play for but in a band these guys suck. I'm going to find a new band. (laughs) You know, this one person is really cool and I connect. So we're going to quit the band and find other people we connect with. So yeah. So like the long tangent of like all of those techniques and skills that I were like, was was just using because it's like what felt genuine to me, I realized was a lot of what therapists do. Yeah. And so I, it was immediately attracted to becoming, um, becoming a counselor. So, so I mean, with, with you talking and our, you know, exchanges before and communicating, you're a very level dude, right? And, and mm-hmm. very, like, sort of articulate and calm. Is that how you've always been? Or is that something that you've, because of the profession that, you in, that you're in, is that something that you learn, right? Because for, for me, I, I don't know if I could ever do what you do for one reason, because I'm excitable, right? Like, Mm-hmm. I pitch up and down. I'm not, when I'm speaking, I, I, I want to interject, you know, some, some feeling to it. Right. And how you're talking and, and it's very, uh, it, it feels to me a very precise and even way that you're doing, <laughs> but is that who you've always been? Or Hell, no, absolutely not. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> I was, I, <laughs> uh, dude, I was in therapy for like, a year or so because of like severe anger issues. And that still pops up every once in a while. Like I am easily agitated. Um, and I have to do like a lot of self-talk like by myself to kind of like process what's happening and then calm myself down. So I don't completely snap all the time because I, I can't, I just have that quick time. I got that Italian temper. Oh, um, I know that one. Yeah. But so through the profession, like I learned um, patience right? Because you can't, when you're in a session with somebody, you have to learn just to listen. Like I've had sessions where it was 45 minutes of silence of just sitting with someone and whether they're on their phone or just drawing on a piece of paper, you know, that's what they needed that day. Um, Mm. And the field that I'm in with community mental health, you kind of see the worst of the worst because I'm not working with individuals who have careers and private insurance and they're going to the therapist because they're having like uh you know some depressive episodes and they need to work it out because like their you know fortune 500 company job is like struggling with it um it's a lot of hey i'm homeless living out of a car and i've got severe depression and how do and i have a heroin addiction and i relapsed and i overdosed at this time so you can't really be excited excitable in that situation because that's going to trigger the client so you, sometimes you have to be, I had to learn to be like that rock that they can come in and they can pace around the office and they can scream and curse and yell and cry and be super happy and experience mania if they have bipolar and know that like, okay, my therapist is just sitting there and it's just like the supportive, well, I'm just say rock. I'm just going to use that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like using like learning the techniques from classes and actually working in the field. Um, and plus it's like, I'm very much practice what you preach. So when I'm telling a client, Hey, it's not that big of a deal. Let it go. <laughs> I can't go home and get mad because Ryan doesn't do artwork in time. So growing up, were you the dude that like, did you find that like you were the dude that like everybody talked to about things? Yeah. But that that kind of had to be in you. Cause like, as you were talking, like you, you triggered a ton of stuff, like even like for me, because yeah. it's like, 
growing up, you, everybody has these circumstances Mm -hmm. that like lead to, um, how you like to handle, like how you handle your, your day to day. Right. So like for me, like my dad leaving when I was like a young kid and like growing up with a single, like all, whatever, I can go into tons of stories, but early on for me, I remembered that like, Oh, everybody around me isn't really, uh, like keeping it together. So like, Mm -hmm. it just, I have to be, I have to keep it together. Like everybody is going to be super emotional. So like, I actually have to keep my emotion in check because if I go and get too emotional, it actually screws everything up. Um, because you don't get a, you don't get to help anybody that way. Cause you're just like in an emotional mess. Mm-hmm. And then your reality is just always constantly skewed if you kind of hang out yeah. in that emotion. And so, you know, I relate to what you said, like, yeah, growing up when I was a kid, like I was definitely like sports dude. And then you go to like middle school and then like, you're like, Oh, cool. Like it meant like the preppy phase. And then all of a sudden, like I discovered punk rock and then that changed everything. And then I was like, Oh, well, Oh, cool. This is where like, I can be me, but I never, I never lost sight of like, uh, or stopped being aware of like all the other, like, you know, pods of people around me, like, Oh, like I actually started paying more attention to like, Oh, this is why the metal kids kind of like hang that way. Oh, this is why the jock kids kind of do that. And then me being like a music dude, like, you know, I just dove, you know, I had really great teachers that helped me like dive deeper into like expression Mm -hmm. and how to, you know, how to actually take whatever I was thinking, whatever I was feeling and actually manifesting it into something else where Mm -hmm. it's like, Oh, there it goes. Like that's out of me now. Like I can celebrate it. I dig it. Um, you know what I mean? But yeah, like I, I feel like when I meet dudes like you, yeah, that's one of the questions. Like, well, you read the dude that everybody talked to. And my second question is, uh, are you an Enneagram guy at all? Uh, what was the second one? Are you an Enneagram guy? Like the personality, like the numbers? Uh, I don't pay attention to that too okay. much. I'm a horrible therapist for that. <laughs> I, should. <laughs> I should, but um, so this is going to sound super cocky and I hope it doesn't. Um, I find that rolling with a title, like when people get super into their astro- uh, astro- astrology symbol, yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. That, that becomes like a manifest, like you manifest that because you want it oh, to be sure. true. Sure. 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 So well, it's like yeah. a big fortune cookie. You know what I mean? That's how yeah. I look at it. And like and the, the personality tests, like they're super helpful because like, especially yeah. when you give it, cause like someone's like, you know, for me, it's like, I'm an introverted extrovert. Right. Like that's what I like. I love being alone and I'm hyper independent. Thank God my wife is the same way. Otherwise we drive each other bonkers. Huh. Um, but I also like want to go out. So it's like, you know, it's good to kind of help like understand that and like have that personality balance. But it's like, I have clients who are like, I'm e- uh, ENFJ. Like that's all I have. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. that. I was like, yeah, okay, cool, but you're you're still using dope. We need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're still um, you're still not self aware enough to see that you're actually throwing your life away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I was the kid everyone talked to, and like looking back, because when you do when you study like psychology and you're doing the work and the um the role model like the uh, role plays and stuff in class you really start to look back at your life and see different things. And I realized that I've always had this natural curiosity about like what's going on in people's lives. And I had a weird ass memory. Like mm-hmm. you could be like, Oh yeah. Like my favorite blue like shirt, like I lost it and I'm really bummed. And like, we could be talking like two years and you would be wearing them, like, yo, you found your blue shirt. They're like, how the fuck do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Um, or if someone was like really struggling, I always found myself like wanting to know, like, like that yeah. natural curiosity, which in mental health really helps because like I work with a lot of prisoners and or like people who've come out of prison, of course. And that's what I mean. And no one ever asked them about their experience in jail or they asked me, like, did you kill somebody? Oh, you know, yeah. Did you get assaulted? It's like, but I've always been fascinated with like, what was your experience like? What was it like coming up to those big walls with like the barbed wire at the top, knowing that like you're, there's no way out. You can't just say off, like, let me off the ride. Like I'm done. Well, you yeah. know, and they're like, no one's ever asked me that question. So I, I feel like looking back, I've always been like that curious about people and like wanting to know like what's going on. Not in a, uh, in a weird way. Just, it was just super fascinating. I just loved hearing people's stories. Like, 
it's That's one cool. of the reasons like some of my favorite podcasts is like i love this one and i love like the lead singer syndrome and stuff because you get to actually hear someone's story love it so uh i was thinking too so when you're working as a therapist or counselor in a, in a way it's similar to an entertainer and the fact that you are servicing someone else. It's not about you. You are entertaining someone else. You are helping someone else. You know, mm-hmm. they're two s- similar slash adjacent things. Um, have, did you have um, touring experience uh, while you were going through your own personal like mental health situation? And did that affect how it was on the road? Because as you know, the rest of us here, like we've traveled, we've done a bunch of stuff, but what people don't realize is you could still do a bunch of cool, fun things. And it doesn't matter how cool your life is. Mental health is mental health and it's very Mm -hmm. stigmatized. And, you know, people think that if your life is seemingly great, then nothing matters and you're totally fine and everything's happy. So like, can you kind of explain like your like touring experience, like dealing with that kind of stuff too? Has that made it harder for you? Um, so when I was like going through like in high school and everything, like I, I didn't really get to play like my first show until college because where I'm at, there's not a lot of musicians. Like there's a lot of, yeah, I want to start a band. I'm going to buy a drum set. Hey, are you buying that drum set? Nah, I changed my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, like I was one of the only people in like my entire like high school class who owned a guitar, like literally one of three people. Um, so, but, uh, going through touring as I got older and like leaving like grad school for two weeks and having to talk about talk to my professors about why I'm missing two weeks and begging them not to fail me you know there was a lot of mental health with that because there's a lot of stress and then when you go to your first couple shows and there's not really many people there it's like is this worth literally I'm just getting kicked out of school for and having like you know is my is you know is my at the time my girlfriend um is she like really pissed off when she sees that I'm not like, Hey, you need to help me pay for the bills. <laughs> so it was, um, it was really challenging with that because I feel like I got into touring older with like more responsibilities than most people do. Like you kind of tour when you're younger and then you have those responsibilities come in, but, um, it was definitely challenging, but what helped is I guess having like the skills I was able to like sit down and say, okay, you're experiencing this because of this, you got to talk it out with this person or with these people. Um, but what I think really did help is like when we're on tour as like a band, if like Ryan or Cody are going through something, like I can like help them with that so that they can kind of keep focused and keep calm on the road and not want to like, bail out early and go home not like we've ever gotten to that point but you know kind of like what you were saying um that would be about you needing to be the rock for your friends because if you lose your shit then all shit's <laughs> all hell's breaking loose yeah you, know, you said two things right and and one uh just from knowing you you're you're and you said it as well you're 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 the guy who's taking care of business right so you're spearheading a lot of the stuff on tour anyway, you know, de facto tour manager Mm -hmm. plus band member plus worrying about merchandise plus worrying about keeping everything on track to move forward. Right. And the, the thing that I impressed me about goalkeeper just generally great songs and, and good dudes, but it's the work ethic. It's the constant, we're moving forward. We're and it's our mantra, right. Which is gotta move the, the needle has to move forward every day. Right. It could just be yep. this little incremental push. But wow. Like after you look back on a lot of those, it feels like, you you know, wet miles. Right. Yeah. And I, I always, you know, have been impressed with the fact that your band, yourself think in that forward way. Right. That's that's mm-hmm. number one. And I just wanted to say that because not only you're there and, and you're the rock for friends emotionally, but you're also the 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 creative that's a rock for business to always think about these little moves forward right Mm -hmm. and that's that's a a wild place to be because there's you have to be aware of you know sort of self-care and things like that because that weight is is a very a very heavy one to 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 have around right Right. Uh, especially when, when everybody else is at the bar kicking it like dude i have no care in the world whatever and you're going Dude, we're down to one last medium shirt. How the fuck are we going to get like more medium shirts? We have five more shows, whatever, right? Like, right, yeah. And 
So that, that's number one. Number number two for me, like as you're just kind of, you know, talking and, and I'm getting a, a clearer, clearer picture of how things are going. And for me, I just, I, I have to know, like, you know, you had some issues, you know, sort of like temper and anger issues and you've gone through, like, what is a couple things that people who are listening who might be going through some stuff can do? You, you say that there's accountability is always a big thing that mm. if you're not happy with the people around you, you could change that. Right. Right. Um, and so I heard you say self-talk a few times where mm -hmm. you're talking to yourself. Like for me, I, I know there's people sitting there going, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, not that I'm on steady ground, you know, and what, what are a few things that people could just do to, to kind of stay afloat, man? Like that, that's, uh, you know, and, I know that's a complicated question and I know it's different for everybody, but mm -hmm. you know, there, there has to be a, a starting point for everybody that's on the same level. Right. So one of the things I, and actually I did this today cause I, I have several new clients. Um, one of the things that I always preach in my sessions and with anybody is acceptance. And acceptance isn't being okay with something, right? I don't have to be okay if someone's treating me like crap and just let it go. I, but acceptance, the way I pre, the way I talk about it is just it's reality, right? This is what's happening. And so then that kind of leads into listening, right? And hearing, like, like processing the situation. If someone is just screaming at you, don't listen to respond, because you're going to grab onto the first thing that they say, they're going to be five minutes down the road through their yelling tangent. You're going to respond and they're going to be like, I talked about that five minutes ago. You're not listening to me, but to listen and process what is actually being said, what is the situation accepting that this is, this is reality. This is actually happening right now. This is how you're treating me or this is what's being said, or this is this douchebag, <laughs> douchebag day of show contact who tries to say that there weren't enough people at the venue to pay us. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then you go into commitment, right? So it's, okay, I accept that this is my reality. I fully understand what's going on. Now I have the power to make a choice of how I handle the situation. And it's a very quick process, of course, like which is within seconds, obviously, but it's always recognizing that you have the power to make that choice of how you handle what's in front of you. And again, acceptance, you don't have to, ex you know, just be okay with it. Like, oh, screw it out. I, I guess you're just going to be mean to me. No, no, no. But there is the understanding. This is the reality. This is true, real life. You can't ignore it. You can't run from it. This is exactly what's happening. So now you get to, you have the power to make the choice of how you deal with it. And then you can deal with it the way you feel, right? But for me with my anger, I had to realize that by snapping and having these outbursts of aggression, there came consequences with that, you know, losing friends, you know, getting written up at work, you know, things like that. And for some people who, as they say, black out or see red, there's a lot worse consequences, such as like jail time and things like that. Um, but, you know, but even if you don't handle it that way, there's still consequences are positive and negative. So that's what I always kind of preach to people. It's just like that acceptance of what's going on listening and processing the situation and then can like understanding that you have the you actually have the choice of how you handle it but you're not gonna ha you're not gonna understand the real choice that you have if you don't do the first two steps um so that's kind of where like if someone's saying i have no idea where to start it's like okay let's just practice this let's pick something like a small example of a stressor that happened maybe you got really agitate because someone cut you off on the road and let's break that break that down that situation down using this it's called act therapy acceptance and commitment um and let's use this and then we can apply it to this situation and then we can start to apply it to bigger situations so mm -hmm. that's kind of like my my blanket statement that i i tell especially when someone's coming in for therapy and they whether they've had therapy for years or this is their first time it's like okay this is kind of like where i start from you know it's i want to know if you agree with what i said earlier where sort of the creative uh community it seems like there's a disproportionate of people that suffer from 
you know, more depression and, and uh, mm-hmm. definitely more substance abuse, right? Like of it course. feels that way to me just by being around that community for a long time. It feels like there's a lot more people that take a lot more to heart and, and, mm-hmm. and that heavy burden. Like, do you think, do you think that it's like that? Or uh, maybe I'm just not seeing the complete other side like you are, but it feels like that to me. I think there definitely is, but that's also because I feel like creatives in any sort of entertainment industry are the most vulnerable because you're really putting yourself out there. Like most other jobs you can hide behind, right? Take the person who has the office job who just works at a computer all day. They can be the happiest looking person in the world every day and no one would under- know that they're suffering from like crippling depression when they leave or throughout the entire day. But you know, when a person writes a song or is acting in a certain role in a movie or writing a book or a poem, you know, it's kind of hard to hide how you truly feel. And so you really understand like, oh, wow, this person is suffering from severe depression or anxiety or, um, you know, the painting clearly shows there's hallucinations and delusions that they experience. So to open yourself up like that, to inevitably inevitably be judged (laughs) you know you start to you know you see that enhance i think enhancement like in depression and anxiety because like especially in today's world with like social media you know i mean we're victim of it it's like how many streams are we getting a day oh my god we're going down monthly listeners oh my god we're going up and it's like you know it's just constant with that so um and with the substance abuse, I mean, a lot of it's just like, how do I distract myself from not wanting to look at Spotify numbers or my Facebook likes or uh, when someone gives a record like the three out of 10 stars that you threw your heart and soul into, yeah. how do I like not remember that, you know? And then uh, I think just like I was saying, like in high school earlier, just trying to fit in, right? It's like when you're out on the road and you're, especially you're a new band and you're trying to like, f- like connect with the cool touring band that took you on the road. It's like, oh, well, they're partying. I got a party and I got to party harder. And that's actually what a lot of the students were going through with Villanova. Most of the students I had were the ones who didn't have a whole lot of money. So they couldn't go shopping at like what's called the King of Prussia Mall and go to, you know, uh, Nordstrom and just drop a thousand dollars. They were the ones like, well, I can make it up through partying. So their identity became through that. Um, yeah. So I would, I would say that's just, that's one of my things is just, you know, you're really putting yourself out there and like I said, more vulnerable than any other profession. And, uh, and that opens yourself up you know, that vulnerability also opens yourself up for those criticisms and which can worsen, um, you know, the depression, anxiety, and, you know, other mental health diagnoses you might have. Yeah. I want to go back to what you were talking about earlier though, like with choices, I feel like choices are, are, it's such a simple thing. Well, we have a choice. You know what I mean? It's like something that I know, like my wife and I say to our kids all the time, but beyond the fact that like knowing that you have a choice or not is actually, well, hey, like what's the process of making the choice? Mm-hmm. And, I, and like lately I've been on this like, you know, and I, I was saying it to Vinny the other day, like I've been on this like empathy crusade, right? Because even like when stuff bums me out or like stuff will happen, like, you know, I'll say, I'm like, oh, dude, like I'm just totally being negative right now. I'll, I'll be done in like five minutes, but it's just, it's got to get out. And then mm-hmm. I can kind of go back because like, a lot of times, like, we don't realize, like, it's like, it doesn't make you a bad person. It's like, you just have to find the, the right tools to help you choose the thing that you're supposed to choose. You know what I mean? And I think, like, you know, the things I heard you say are, like, really strong principles. Like, yeah, like, we should be slow to speak and quick to listen, right? Like, mm-hmm. we, we don't know how to empathize with each other. Like, sometimes, you know... Uh, whether it's a friend or like my wife or like someone's upset, like they don't need a solution from me. They just need me to sit there and sit in the, you know, anger or sit in the sadness or, you know, like sometimes like if a friend is crying, sometimes that friend just needs you to cry with them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so like before you can even get to the choice part of it and you're, you're doing, because that's the thing, like we weren't meant to do life alone we were meant to do life with other people like Mm -hmm. life in and of itself is one massive collaboration you know but we don't have the tools 
to like walk through it together. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and so how, yeah, how do we help people find what choices are available? You know, how do we help people to empathize with one another more? Um, because sometimes like as creatives, we're like, well, you need a solution. If you, if you can't come up with a solution, you're not a creative person. But the reality is that there's steps, like there's 10 steps that need to happen long before you get to the choice, uh, and long before you get to the solution. So, so how do we, how do we hit people to that idea? Absolutely. That's like the million dollar question, honestly. <laughs> because, I mean, if you think about it from, a t- from the time we're young, we're taught to, we're, we're taught to sympathize, like, oh, I'm so sorry for you, or um, you have to like blame yourself. So you never learn how to, you know, sit there with someone who's crying and just process that with them. You know, that's, you just, we're just not taught that. Um, and let's, I'll be honest, a lot of my therapist friends who have children aren't very good at teaching that themselves either. <laughs> so, sure. sure. Um, but that goes back to that, like, that's the whole process of acceptance though, right? Like I was saying earlier, it's like going through those emotions and coming to that reality that you're in and, and really processing it and understanding like, you know, like there are some people who have no idea how to say that they're angry or they might think like, like, especially with men, men are stereotypically express depression and anger. So, you know, oh, you're just angry. It's like, no, they're actually sad. They're depressed. They're defeated, but they only know how to express it through anger. And we aren't taught about all these different words and these feeling words. So we only know, oh, you're being really loud and aggressive, so you must be angry. We know we're ass- yeah, no. assuming assuming masters, even though we're always wrong on this. But um, yeah, I've always been like a sensitive dude, right? And I've always like liked like sneakers and fashion and things like mm-hmm. that. And dude, I've had like people just be like, <laughs> "Bro, I just always thought you were gay." Like really? <laughs> like, so like so when you talk when you start talking about like the things that are associated with men, it's just like, dude, really? Like, it's 2020, bro. Like, yeah. come on, man. Yeah. I mean, I got that too growing up because like you want to actually just talk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's like, you don't want to just like slam beers and hit on chicks. I was like, nah, I just want to talk. Yeah. I like substance um, for sure. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, that's part of that like beginning stage of just, you know, processing what the situation is, how you feel about the situation, how you like where you see yourself in that space. Right. And understanding like our roles, like it's, it's just, it's, it's like a very blanket term when I said earlier, but there's so many steps. That's why I always say we're going to, we're going to try doing these interventions in very like easy stuff first. Right. We're not going to have, we're not going to have the existential crisis talk in this third session. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. As much as the insurance company might want us to, cause they only want to, you know, pay for 16 sessions but that's, that's another conversation man <laughs> yeah that's, exactly but uh, the the thing you know it's for a lot of creative friends that i know they're all you know sort of like you know uh, bullet point action oriented people myself included right it's okay i got five things to do today or i got five steps i gotta do to get to this end point and what you're saying and what i'm hearing at least you know there's an equal amount of steps for, you know, your own mental health, you know, you have to take these like, you know, slow steps forward to untangle the knots that are there. Right. And uh, you have to, you have to kind of be in touch with how you're feeling and know the the sort of terminology, because for me, I, I consider myself a a rather, uh, when I grew up, when I grew up in New Jersey, it was very stoic wasn't like a, a very expressive thing, I, you know, child. I wasn't really an expressive teenager until my later years. And then it went from like zero to fucking 100, right? Where mm-hmm. the punker is oh, just like, to destroy everything. I'm going to smoke everything. I'm going to drink everything. I'm going to snort everything that is possible. I'm going to get fucking live, right? And right. For, for a long time, that fueled this sort of like, forward movement and hurled me into another place. But deep down and deep in like sort of my, my head, I, I came to conclusions of how to get back to a better mental health place through those like little steps of like, Hey, I I can't leave the house today. Like, I don't know how to talk to 
my best friends. I don't know anything. And when I was in that headspace, I was going little by little and trying to untie, like, dude, I had a mile long of knots, right? Mm-hmm. And I was trying to undo those knots one at a fucking time. And a lot of people want to have that existential talk, right? Mm-hmm. I, I want it. I don't know what, but dude, there's, there's so much more to it, you know? that are hiding in the, uh, the, the crevices and so many nuances to emotion and your history and everything that goes along with it, that people want to rush for a cure, but there's no rush cure. It, it, it needs to be slow and it needs to be, you know, uh, very, you know, uh, uh, you have to decide on the place that you want to be incrementally. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, that's good. I always tell people too, that, um, Cause I mean, I get a lot of clients like I want this fixed right now. I don't want to be in this space anymore. Fix me. And it's like, well, <laughs> um, no. So, uh, <laughs> it's not going to happen that way. But what I always say, like if, to use like your example of any of like the knot, right. It's like, well, I got a mile of knots. It's like, okay. But when you get done untying all of them, you will have still accomplished that. It might take you, it's three months. It might take you three years, but regardless, you're going to be at that goal. And that's kind of the mantra for our band too, right? It's like, it, we don't need to be successful in two and a half, three years. Like you read online, like, Oh, if it's nothing's happening in three years, it's like, it doesn't matter if it takes us seven years, we still got there and we're still stoked. Um, and that's very like the same thing with like mental health. It's like, it, it's, it's not about how quickly you can get there because even if you got there super quickly, but you really didn't understand the hows and the whys and like your role in everything and your feelings and really able to process it, then the solution or the ending is just so hollow and you're bound to make the same mistakes. So especially with addiction, like when I was, when I was working with those who, um, cause I was working right above North Philly. And for those who don't know, North Philadelphia, Kensington has the worst opiate crisis in the country. And so a lot of every one of my clients have been homeless in uh, Kensington at one point or another. Um, And if you guys want to know what it's kind of like, go on Instagram, follow Kensington Beach and you'll and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, Not for the faint of heart, though. So not not safe for work tag on that. Um, It's really it's hard to watch. So if you're easily triggered, I wouldn't do it. But um, that's a bad way of saying it. But you know what I mean? Uh, So we would like, so someone would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm so stoked. I have three years clean. It's the greatest thing in the world. I'm like, yeah, but your three years clean is like in my mind. I'm like, it's so hollow because you don't know what caused, like what's relating to the addiction or how to handle when you are you know, freaking out and you have no idea what to do. You don't know the relationship with yourself and the substances or your relationship with yourself and the things that led you to wanting to use these substances. So yeah, you could have six, seven, eight years clean, but because you haven't processed all of these and taken that journey and really opened yourself up, you're bound to relapse. Um, and you're bound to have that effect again, and especially at mental health. It's the same way. It's like, if you don't understand your relationship with, you know, especially with my clients with um, who have hallucinations and delusions, understanding the relationship with that and how to uh, work with those, you can't just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. So you know, by understanding, like I said, going back and understanding like yourself and your role and really diving into everything, then you can understand the relationship and that whole process. So when you do get to the, uh, the end of the rope, basically, or the, the finish line, and you really have accomplished like what you want to accomplish, it's so fulfilling because you can look back and say, well, this is what led me to drink and this is why and this and that and, ev- and everything in between so that when you're faced with those challenges and adversities again, because inevitably you will be, you know, you can't run away from things forever. That kind of also goes into that acceptance piece that I was saying. Um, you know, when you do hit those problems again, you are so confident and, for, and have all the tools you need to overcome that. And I think creatives do that really well because, you know, you're constantly self-analyzing and trying to be self-aware, especially as you're putting lyrics on paper, because you also have to think that you know, lyrics and music, it's like, do I really want to say it this way? Mm-hmm. Is this how I feel? 
And when you really dive into that and you have all that self-actualization and the realizations of who you are, I feel like you can, it's easier to step away from making those same mistakes that you did when you were younger and didn't know. Um, That's awesome. I know John, I'm oh, oh. sorry, John, I know you have a question, mm -hmm. but I was going to say, we should, there's something, I don't want to be like, get into the semantics of it, but we should totally set up a part two of this conversation. Because I just think, A, it's super important. I know everybody here thinks it's important. And I think it's just insanely fascinating. That idea of a relationship with yourself, right? Like, we hear the cliche all the time, like, well, if you can't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. But, like, that doesn't really cover the half of it, does it? Mm -hmm. Right? And so that idea of, like, figuring out how to have a relationship with yourself so that you can then go on and have healthy relationships with other people and just with life and the day-to-day, -day, like, that to me is fascinating um and so that I, i'm so, jano i know you want to ask a question but with that being said i think we should all agree to have a part two of this thing because <laughs> it's really really good stuff well, um, i'm here i'm just working from home not going anywhere so. sick, sick. <laughs> all right so we, sh we should now that we, we've done that but go ahead jano you can ask your oh, last pressure question. obi <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh so <laughs> um so one thing i wanted to bring up so I deal with pretty intense anxiety and I'm also, you know, like Vinny and Obi, I'm doing a lot of stuff all the time. Uh, so there's a way um, creatives try and quantify, like, I feel this way, I have this void, I need to fill it with things and keep the things going as many times as I can because you're almost filling that void instead of substances, you're, you have stuff, projects, you have your fingers and all these things. And I think about how my personal evolution as someone who, um, you know, I started touring when I was like 17 or something like that. So the second I was out of high school, got in a van, started going. But the, and again, this could be a lot of part two stuff, but um, being in a van and living away from home for, and going to a different place every single day for 30 days at a time on a regular basis mm -hmm. is a very not human thing. <laughs> and like the human brain is not programmed to do that because you know we're like essentially made to like be within a tribe of was like 80 people or there's 80 to 100 people there's something like right. that but now you look at social media where people have thousands of followers and they i've personally slept at over a thousand people's houses that i don't know most of their names like mm -hmm. like you know you're constantly meeting all these people so for me it was i sometimes i'll go back to my old bands and go okay, I remember writing this really emotional song or record and it was about like, there was a girl I liked at the time and she didn't like me back. Or like, man, my grandma died. That's crazy. Or like something like that. And then you, as you go on, it's like these personal relationships because you haven't experienced the world. Then you experience the world and you're like, oh shit. And then there's this like, you, you, you could kind of watch like the phases and especially in like pop punk bands, like because I've been in that same thing. Mm -hmm. And you watch these... Um, people start seeing the world from different perspectives and then there's like heavier things that they deal with, but it's the exact same heaviness as when you're younger, but just different things you're dealing with. Right. Um, so is there a way you like, when you're working with people, you kind of explain to them that like, you can't compare uh, problems with someone else. So for me personally, mm -hmm. like I was like my, a lot of my uh, like chemical imbalance was caused based on re repression because I would never open up about stuff. I'd always keep everything in me, bubbly politician guy that made everyone happy, you know? Right. Um, so then you fast forward and you go, oh, well, this guy's going through some stuff. I don't want to bring up me. That's whatever. So as someone who's do doing that yourself, how, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you navigate that? Uh, well, in my sessions, sometimes self-disclosure self is helpful because people don't want to feel alone, kind of go back to the tribe because that's part of the with mental health, sometimes you feel like you're the only one who's suffering from this and like no one else is suffering from anxiety or depression or anything else. So sometimes the self-disclosure is definitely helpful. Like, Oh yeah. Like this, like this relates a little bit of like what I went through, but I always go back to the same statement when there's someone's like kind of, I get a lot of minimiz uh, minim minimizing. That's the word mm -hmm. um, with clients of like, well, I really can't complain because these people have it harder. And I always go back to this, like the old saying, like hard isn't relative, hard is hard. And what you were saying, Obi, earlier about just like being there with someone, like sometimes you, 
I don't know, it just like feels right knowing when to bring something up and when you just need to like shut your mouth and listen, you know? And especially if you hear, I mean, sometimes it's like writings on the wall, like no one understands me. It's like, well, actually, like, you know, this is what I went through. <laughs> Does that really, I had a client um, when I said earlier how like I had like the birthday party with like the no, like no one showed up. You know, why the clients like no one under ever understand what it's like not to have a friend show up at a birthday party. I'm like, actually, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, so it, it's, yeah, it's definitely hard not to like want to compare, but I, but then I always go back to like when we're listening and we're responding to somebody, there's also like the purpose of the response. So am I bringing this up about myself or about something else because I want to talk about me or do I genuinely feel like it's going to be helpful for you? Mm-hmm. You know, so when you think about that, and that's kind of like the process of like listening to listen, not listening to respond, which is a really hard concept. And I struggle with it all the time, even in my therapy sessions, um, especially when someone's like running off on a tangent and you're like, no, no, go back, go back, go back to that repression that you said, <laughs> you know, five minutes ago. Um, but yeah, so like you know, there's like that purpose of like, okay, why am I saying this? Am I saying this? Like I said, because I want to talk about me and I'm don't, I don't know how to sit with you in this space or do I genuinely think it'll help? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that answer what, the, that answer the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just, I got sucked in man for like a brief moment. I was like, am I talking? Like, do I talk too much? Like I hear myself like, this Rubik's Cube has me wildly like freaked out right now. And I was like, okay, I'm back. I'm back. Dude, that's one of the, the everyone, like Cody and Ryan always gave me shit because I talk so much, like, all, like all the time, but it's because I can never talk during my work day. Like, I'm, just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, so you're a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, um, awesome. Dude, but, yeah. you know what? I, I, we have to wrap this up now, you know, but. Dude, let's do let's do part two, man. I, I really sure. like I want to take this and then I want to listen to it through and then get more questions. I, I would love to have you back for a part two. Uh, of yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Uh, dude, thanks so much for, for taking the time. We're going to do part two of this for sure, man. I, hey, well, thank you. Nice meeting all of you, too. Everyone yeah, here, man. Everyone here yeah. rules. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for being here, dude. Yeah, thanks, man. I just had a real quick question from Mark, if that's okay. It's like if there are people listening right now and they're just, they don't really know what to do, they're struggling with something, like is, can you give like the five, the nickel tour of like what someone should do to get started in therapy or even where to turn to? Like where, where is there any like resources out there on the internet or maybe a phone call that someone can make to just get the ball rolling? So I always tell people, because um, this is always the thing that deter, that deters people away, um, is going is like you get the courage and you go you find that community mental health program or like that therapist and you go in there and you're ready to spill your guts and ready to process and they say we don't take your insurance mm-hmm. and there's like nothing more defeating than that I feel like for a lot of clients because it's like I did all of this just to be rejected again um, so first things first whether you have like Medicare Medicaid or you do have a private insurance company call the number on the back and and ask them where like who are the like the uh, approved therapists and psychiatrists in your area that they cover um so then you can go online and you can research those names and see if they have any reviews about them um but at least that way you know okay i'm gonna go to this place i know they take my insurance and now i'm just kind of reading the reviews and seeing like who's got really good experiences also talk to friends too like if you have that friend or family member you're really close to who might who sees who actively sees a therapist um get their information and call but i always say insurance first just because like i said there's nothing more defeating than just that you're automatically rejected when you're ready to take that first step going in there yeah thanks if you don't if you don't have insurance sorry it's it's very easy um you can just go on like the u.s like the government website and you can sign up for Medicare, Medicaid. And, um, it takes a, just doesn't take long, maybe a week at best. And then you can get all the information and then they can walk you through which places in your area are 
you know, they, they cover and that can go for primary health care, like a doctor, dental, eye. Um, and then obviously, you know, what we're talking about, mental health. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. This has been great. And yeah, we're definitely going to have you back for a part two. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll forgo the, the, the evil plugs for this evening is we're, you know, we're all a little tapped out at the moment and we'll <laughs> come back for a, a part two with Mark Giuliano. Thank you so much and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you.